Hi, welcome to the lesson on the integumentary system. So today we're going to look at all sections of the integumentary system. Remember that consists of the skin, the hair and the nails. So we're going to look at those in separate sections and then look at the uh, functions of those systems when they all come together to make the integumentary system and then what impact our treatments can have on the system and vice versa. So to begin with, the skin. So we know that the skin is the outer covering of the body. It protects the body from anything getting in towards the vital organs. Um, so it sort of is a suit of armour that's protecting the inside of the body. Um, the skin, I've got a handy diagram here, is made up of three main layers. We've got the top layer here, which is closest to the surface is our epidermis. We have our middle layer here, which is known as the true skin, which is the dermis. And then we've got our third layer down here, which is made up of fat cells or adipose tissue. And this is known as the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. Beneath this layer, we have muscle and beneath the muscle, we have bone. So we're ignoring those bits at the moment, but just so you understand the structure. And we're looking at this top section. So let's look at this very top layer of the skin, the epidermis. The epidermis has five layers to it. So for our level three names of those layers, they all start with the name stratum, which means layer, and then they have a second name after them. So if we start from the top and work our way down and we'll talk about each of the layers afterwards. So our very top layer, this is the layer that we're putting our makeup on, our moisturizers, the layer that we're washing our bodies in the shower. This is the stratum corneum. Or for level two, we would know this as the horny layer. So it's the outermost layer of the epidermis. Our next layer down is the stratum lucidum or the clear layer. Underneath that, so our third layer down is the stratum granulosum or granular layer. We then have the stratum spinosum or the prickle layer. And lastly, at the very base here, we have the stratum germinativum or the basal layer. So that very top layer, the stratum corneum is constantly shedding, it's dead. Um, there's no feeling or sensation. We don't bleed when that layer comes away. When we get into the shower and we do a full body exfoliation or when we're doing that on our clients, it's that stratum corneum that's coming away. Constantly shedding. You take off a pair of black trousers or black tights at the end of the day, you see all the little specks of white in there, that's your stratum corneum. Um, so it's constantly shedding, constantly desquamating. It's just naturally exfoliating away from the surface of the skin. Um, and our treatments can help that process. Our massage and our exfoliation can help that process. Next layer down, the stratum lucidum, is our clear layer or our waterproofing. So this is the area, um, or this is the layer that if we get into the bath or a swimming pool, the reason we don't absorb all of that swimming pool or all of that bath of water is because of that stratum lucidum. So it acts as a waterproofing layer. So we allow some absorption of water because our fingers and our toes go wrinkly, so they do absorb some water, but it's that stratum lucidum that stops the water to being absorbed any further. Otherwise, we would walk out of the bath with no bath water in, we would have absorbed it all. So stratum lucidum, very clever, waterproofing. The next two layers, the stratum granulosum and the stratum spinosum, are where our cells start to become much more granular and dehydrated. So still dead skin cells, but as they've moved away from the base layer, which we'll talk about in a second, they become much more granular, they become much more dried out and hard and sort of prickly or the prickle cell. So working through the spinosum and the granulosum are new cells which are soft and bouncy and, and you know, bright become dehydrated as they become a, as they come away from the blood circulation and they start to die and they start to harden that process of hardening is called keratinization so keratinization starts in the spinosum and continues so not quite the base layer but starts in the spinosum 
continues through the granulosum. So they start to um, keratinize, to harden, um, because we want hardened cells to be our protective layer. It makes sense that we don't have soft, bouncy new cells. We want something that's been a little bit hardened. And then we're talking about the very base layer, the basal layer or the stratum germinativum. This is the only layer of the epidermis that has a blood supply and has a nerve supply. So the cells at the stratum germinativum are living. Once they leave the germinativum, there's no blood supply anymore. So they then are dead and then go through that keratinization process. So stratum germinativum, we know that we've got living cells because there's a blood supply. But also what those living cells do is they reproduce. So as the cells start to push up towards the surface of the skin, new cells at the stratum germinativum are being reproduced, which is then pushing the older cells up to be the spinosum. The spinosum cells become the granulosum, the granulosum become the lucidum, the lucidum become the corneum, and the old corneum ones shed. So there's a process of those new cells pushing each layer up as they're produced. That process of new cells being created is called mitosis. Mitosis is simple cell division. So that happens in the skin, it's happening in the nail, and it's happening in the hair as well to reproduce those cells. So these cells here have a blood supply and a nerve supply. So if we cut the skin, and it doesn't bleed, we've perhaps grazed it, so some of the skin comes away, um, that would mean that we haven't destroyed too many layers. But if we cut the skin and it bleeds and it hurts, we know that we've got down to that germinated them. So how does that impact our treatments? Well, the timing that it takes for your stratum germinated them, so your new cells to become what we see on the surface of the skin as the corneum, takes around 28 to 35 days. So what we're feeding into our bodies now is what's going to show in our skin in around a month's time. Because these cells are being fed with the nutrients and the water that we're putting into our bodies now. So what's really important for clients to understand is that detoxing two days before an event or drinking lots of water a week before their wedding is not going to have the most impact on their skin. What we do to our bodies now is going to show on the surface of our skin in around a month's time. Now that process does slow down. So as we age, um, the process of these new cells becoming your corneum does slow down. Um, so we generally say 28 to 35 days. Right, then we move down into the dermis. This is known as the true skin. And this is where a lot of the structures are supported in this area two layers to our dermis. We have a papillary layer um, that lines all of the structures and the stratum germinative with a blood supply. So everything that needs to live needs a blood supply. So all of these structures, which we'll list in a moment, will all have a blood supply, as does, we know, the stratum germinative, so that cell division can happen. So the papillary layer is a very thin layer that just lines and gives blood to all of these structures. The rest of that area um, is known as the reticular layer. And that's where we find fibers that give our skin its bounce and its elasticity. So we find the fibers collagen, elastin and reticulin. So it gives our skin the ability to bounce and come back from impact but also gives our skin the ability to stretch, like when we're pregnant or when we're growing as children, our skin is able to stretch. When our, however, when our skin stretches too quickly for the elastin in this particular layer to cope with, we get stretch marks. So sometimes the body grows too quickly um, and the elastin can't keep up with that, so we get what we call stretch marks. So suspended within this reticular layer, we've got some structures. So our first structure is this little pocket here that's housing something. So this is known as our hair follicle. And inside our hair follicle, we have a hair that grows and obviously exits the surface of the skin. Attached onto our hair follicle, we have our sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland secretes sebum. 
um, onto the surface of the skin. Sebum is our skin's natural oil, so it lubricates and protects the skin, but it also lubricates the hair as well. So that's where we get greasy skin if the sebaceous gland is overactive, but also where our hair can get oily as well, where the, se the sebum comes out and through the hair follicle onto the surface of the skin. Also attached to the hair follicle, we have a little muscle, and this is attached to both the hair follicle and the stratum germinativum. This is called the erector pili muscle. This is a little muscle that when we're cold, contracts and it pulls the follicle so that the hair stands on end. The idea behind this is that warm air is trapped between all the hairs on the body and keeps the body warm or keeps a layer of warmth next to the skin when we're cold. That action of the erector pili muscle contracting makes the hair stand on end and it also makes the skin pucker, which is where we get goosebumps from. We've also got a sweat gland here that's attached to the hair follicle. So we've got sweat glands that release sweat or excrete sweat through our hair follicle. But over here, we also have a sweat gland um, that's separate, that releases sweat directly onto the surface of the skin through a sweat duct and out of a pore. In this layer, we also have nerve endings. And so all of this layer will have sensation um, for touch, and it will also link the sensation into that stratum germinativum. Anything up here does not have um, any blood. We know because cells have died and the keratinized, but also no um, nerve supply either. Looking down further, so below the dermis, we have the hypodermis or the sub subcutaneous layer. This is a layer of fat, um, skin fat. So it's that yellow fat that we often see on TV programs when they're doing gory operations. Um, it's a layer of insulation. It helps to protect certain areas of the body. Um, we know this is adipose tissue. So its technical name for fat is adipose tissue. So then moving on to the structure of the hair. So our next part of the integumentary system is the hair. We saw it a little bit in the structure of the skin. We saw the hair follicle with the hair growing out of it. We saw the sebaceous gland and we also saw an erector pili muscle. Um, but this is now the hair broken down into a diagram of its own. So this here is the hair growing from the hair follicle. We would refer to this as the hair shaft. We know that we had a sebaceous gland here and we know that this is the epidermis, those five layers of the epidermis. Around here is the reticular layer of the, um, of the dermis. So this house that our hair is growing in is known as the hair follicle and at the base of the hair follicle we've got our dermal papilla. So this is our blood supply. Remember nothing can grow without a blood supply. So the blood supply comes into the root of the hair here um, and the blood supply enables that mitosis, that reproduction of hair cells to take place. And as those hair cells reproduce, they push up the old hair cells, those push up the older ones and the older ones, and we have the growth of the hair. Soon as the cells come away from the papilla, from that blood supply, they start to keratinize just as our skin does. Um, so they start to harden um, without that blood supply and without a nerve supply. We call this region here the hair bulb, and we know that we've got the hair follicle along here. Our hair growth cycle has three stages. We know them as ACT, anagen, catagen, and telogen. The anagen stage is the growing stage. So this is where the hair has a rich blood supply. The hair is actually growing. Um, those cells are being reproduced and pushing the old cells up and the hair's growing. Um, the hair can stay in this state for up to six years in the anagen state before but less time as well. Um, and there's no set amount of time for each hair. They will all do their own thing. Once we go from the anagen stage, we're going to the catagen stage. We know this is like a transitioning stage. So this is where the hair breaks away from the blood supply and it sort of gets a bit of a club end to it. So it gets a rounded end to it. So it's now no longer growing. There's no blood supply. So there's no reproduction of hair cells. And it's sort of just sitting, transitioning between growing and then its next phase. We know that as the catagen. 
And then lastly, we have the telogen stage where the hair is, we know it, know it's resting, but the hair is coming out. Um, so either the hair falls out or more likely is that a new anagen hair is growing, which then pushes out the old hair, the telogen hair, which is why we don't often notice that we've lost hair because there's always one to replace it. Sometimes you might find in our eyebrows, you think, oh, I've got a bit of a gap there. And it's usually because we've lost a couple of hairs and perhaps the next anagen one wasn't quite ready to come through and replace it. But more often than not, we don't notice that we're losing those eyelashes, your eyebrows. Um, we just know that they're being replaced by another hair. We've got different hair types over the body as well. So the most common we would know is our um, terminal hair. So that's the hair on our head, our eyebrows, eyelashes, under our arms, in our pubic region and on the chests of men. Um, that hair is coarser, usually thicker and usually darker. And it's there as a form of protection. Well, all hair is there as a form of protection. But generally our terminal hair is there to protect our most vulnerable areas. So the top of our head is where we lose most heat. So the hair is there to protect that. We've got eyebrows to protect our eyes from sweat. Eyelashes to protect our eyes from um, anything in the air, dust particles, etc. And then we've got hair that grows in more vulnerable areas of our body to aid extra protection. We've then got vellus hair, which covers all the rest of our body, um, apart from the palms of our hands, the soles of our feet and our lips. This hair is fine, downy hair. Um, usually not offensive to people wanting to remove it. We more want to remove terminal hair um, in the form of waxing and shaving, um, but does cover the body again as a form of protection, added protection. And then lastly, we have a hair that grows on babies before they're born. So while um, they're in the womb, babies will grow a hair called lanugo hair. This completely covers them from head to toe and is usually shed into the amniotic fluid at about 37 weeks. So babies that are born very prematurely are often quite furry because they haven't gone through the process of shedding that lanugo hair. Again, another form of protection. Um, and sometimes even babies full term, they might have like little bits left like hairy ears or um, back of their neck, but then often you find that that just comes away as they're sleeping and moving around. So we have Terminal hair, the coarser, thicker, darker hair. We have our vellus hair that covers the rest of the body. And then we have lanugo hair, which covers a newborn before they're born, a baby before they're born. So then we come to the structure of the nail. So we know that we've got nails at the ends of our fingers and at the ends of our toes. So this diagram here is split into two sections. This side is beneath the nail. And this side is what we see, and that's what's going on underneath. So firstly, we have our nail plate. So this is what we um, know it protects us. If we bash our fingers, our nail plate is the first thing to get hit. Sometimes it breaks our nail, particularly this area here, which is known as the free edge, the part that grows away from the tip of the finger. Our nail plate is uh, made up of three layers, and those layers are held together by fat and water. Hence why using harsh detergents and chemicals with your bare hands can often lead to peeling nails because those detergents can get between those layers and dissolve the fat and water that hold those layers together. So really important to advise your clients to wear gloves when they're using harsh products. What the nail plate sits on, so underneath the nail plate is our nail bed, um, should be nice and pink in colour and has a sort of Velcro style finish to it, which the underneath of the nail plate also has, so then they can mesh together. Um, obviously they're not stuck fast because nails can be removed, but there is a certain amount of stick there and it's a little bit like a Velcro style that one side sort of slots onto the other side. At the sides here, we have something called nail grooves. They help to guide the nail in a straight line in the way that it's growing. And the nail grooves are protected by something called the nail wall. Up in this region here, 
we've got an area that sits underneath the skin at the base of the nail here. This is called the germinating matrix. This is where that mitosis, that simple cell division, that cell reproduction happens. So very rich blood supply here. And as those new cells are produced, it pushes the cells that were produced before and before that and before that forward, hence why our nails will grow. As the nails remove themselves from the blood supply in this matrix area, they start to keratinize that hardening process that our hair and our skin went through and create then a really good protective layer to the tips of our fingers and the tips of our toes. This here is what we would know as the half moon. It's known as the lanula. And this is the visible part of the matrix. So if you press your half moons on your nails, you'll notice they are much softer than the rest of your nail. And that's because those cells are newer. They haven't gone through as much keratinization as they have as the nail grows down. As a protection around the sides of the nail, we have something called cuticle. So here at the base of the nail, we have um, dead cuticle, um, which helps to protect anything from getting in to where the germinating matrix is. So if you were to put your hand into a big bucket of sand, we don't want the sand to get up into this region here. It could cause infections. And obviously this is the brain of the nail. It's where everything's happening and growing from. So it's important that we keep the area safe. So we have a dead piece of skin called the cuticle. And behind that, we have a living cuticle called the eponychium. At the top of the nail here, between where the skin and the free edge sit, so right up in the nail, we have another type of cuticle. Again, it's living and it's called the hypernychium. And this is a little flap of skin that almost seals the gap between the skin and the nail. So again, if I was to put my hand into a big bucket of sand, we don't want sand to get in between the skin um, or the nail bed and the nail plate. So we um, have that hypernychium there just to act as like a little wall as a protection. Obviously, things can pierce that. So we can get things like splinters up between our nail um, plate and our nail bed. Um, but anything that we put our hands into, as long as that hypernychium is intact, will protect that area underneath the nail. Nails to grow from here to the free edge on our fingers take around six months and our toes around 12 months. So again, what we're doing to our bodies now is what's feeding these cells. So if people are having issues or clients having issues that they've never had with their nails before, um, say peeling or uh, dryness in their nails, we don't necessarily want to think about what they're doing now. We want to be thinking about what was happening when those nail cells were being produced. What were they eating? Were they taking some form of medication at that time? Um, were they particularly poorly? Did they have an illness at that time? Because all of those things would impact how that nail is growing and then by the time it gets here, six months later on our fingers or 12 months on our toes, that's when we're going to see that. So then let's have a think about the function. So when we bring all of those uh, systems together, the skin, the hair and the nails, we form this integumentary system and that system as a whole will have lots of functions. So the first function is really obvious in that it's protection. We know that our skin protects our body, so it acts as that coat of armour to protect the body. Our hair protects vulnerable areas of our body and our nails protect our extremities. So we can see that protection is a huge part of the integumentary system. If we think about the skin as well, that very outer surface of the skin, the stratum corneum, has a layer um, that sits on top of it called the acid mantle. That acid mantle is made up of things like sweat, sebum, dead skin cells, and acts as a little bit of a force field. So any bacteria or anything nasty getting onto the skin, hopefully is engulfed and destroyed by that acid mantle. However, obviously some things can get past that and we can get skin infections and inflammation and bits and pieces, but we do have that extra form of protection in the form of our acid mantle on the surface of our skin. Next, we look at secretion. So secretion is one of our functions. And if you remember looking at the, uh, the structure of the skin, we had our sebaceous gland, which secreted sebum to coat the skin and the hair. 
So remember, sebum is our skin's natural oil. It helps to lubricate, moisturize the skin and the hair um, and it aids that acid mantle protection I just talked about. We also have the function of excretion. Again, looking at the diagram of the skin, um, we excrete sweat. Sweat is a waste product. So we excrete waste products and we excrete that through the sweat glands and out onto the surface of the skin. So excretion is another function. Sensation is another function. So our skin has those nerve endings that allow us the sense of touch. So we have our five senses, our smell, our taste, our hearing, our sight and our touch. And so those nerve endings that sit in the dermis enable us to feel things on our skin and then react to those. So if we touch the oven um, when it's hot, the sensory nerve endings in the skin would pick up that sensation. It would carry it through our sensory nerves to our brain. Our brain will go, oh, that's hot and send a message back via our motor nerves to move our hand away. So you could see that as a form of protection as well, but it's such a significant form of protection. It has its own label as sensation. The skin has the ability to feel. The skin also has the ability to absorb. So as well as release products, excreting sweat and secreting sebum, our skin has the ability to absorb. So we already heard earlier that our skin has the ability to absorb some water. Um, it is then stopped by that stratum lucidum, um, but we can absorb some water. And our bodies, our skin also has the ability to absorb oil. So if we think about the products that we use in our treatments, a lot of them are essential oil based or um, carrier oil based, um, our bodies will be able to absorb a certain amount of that product that we're using and also any water, a little bit of water that's in our um, treatment products as well. So absorption is another form um, or another function of the skin. Also think about what else we might need to absorb through the skin, like medication. So lots of medications now are given in patch style um, or topical creams and lotions. So they can also be absorbed by the skin because predominantly they'll be made up of oil and water, which are the two products that can be absorbed. Our integumentary system also is partly responsible for heat regulation. We talked about those in separate sections when we looked at the skin, but then if we think about it in relation to uh, temperature regulation, we can then um, see that more clearly. So the skin is responsible for this erector pili muscle. Remember that erector pili muscle contracts when we're cold, pulls the hair follicle up, so the hairs stand on end, trapping a layer of warm air next to the skin, and it also creates that pucker in the skin that looks like a, or where we get goosebumps from. So erector pili muscle is responsible for um, when we're cold at helping to regulate that to keep us warm. And our sweat glands are responsible for producing sweat, which is a waste product. But also when the sweat is excreted onto the surface of the skin, it evaporates. As that sweat evaporates, it takes heat away with it. At the same time as the erector pili muscle working when we're cold and the sweat gland working when we're hot, our blood supply will do something depending on whether we're hot or we're cold. So when we're cold and this erector pili muscle is making our hair stand on end, all of our blood is going to pull away from the surface of our body and pull around our vital organs. It's really important that our brain and our heart and our liver and our kidneys are all bathed in blood all of the time and kept warm because without those organs, our body can't survive. Our body doesn't need our fingers or our toes quite as much to survive. So if we are in the cold for an excessive amount of time, the body's ability to pull the blood into the center of the body to bathe those vital organs enables us the best chance to survive for the longest. That's why our fingers go a little bit white or blue. Um, and in extreme cases, we might lose fingers and toes because they die, but the most important thing is our organs stay living. In reverse, when we're hot and our sweat gland is producing sweat to cool us down, our blood supply does the opposite. So it floods out to the surface of the skin. It gives us rosy cheeks, makes us warmer. So we sweat more to get rid of that heat. And actually then our internal organs haven't got so much blood and they don't want to work as hard, which is why in the summer we don't want to eat stodgy, difficult to digest food. Because in the winter, we're happy to eat stodgy, difficult to digest food. Because in the winter, 
Our blood is all around those organs to help that digestive process. But in the summer, it's all out of our skin. So there's no way that we can keep ourselves cool and digest a hot pot. So it's important that um, our body then is alerted to the things that we want to eat and not eat. Our last function of the integumentary system is the production of vitamin D. So we all hear that being out in the sun is good and it helps us to produce this vitamin D and it's our main source of vitamin D is through the sun. So there's a, a substance in our skin called ergostol and when that comes into contact with sunlight, it helps the body to produce vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is vital for the storage of calcium. So it's really good for bones and teeth um, and help, helps with healthy immune system as well. Um, so vitamin D is produced when we, our skin comes into contact with the sunlight. So three sections to our integumentary system, the skin, the hair and the nails, and those three together form that whole system. The main functions of that, those systems, there's seven of them. We've got production, excretion, um, sorry, protection. So protecting the body, the hair protects, the nails protect, skin protects. We've got excretion, so our skin excretes sweat through the sweat glands. We've got secretion, our skin secretes sebum through the sebaceous glands. We've got production of vitamin D when our skin comes into contact with sunlight. We've got absorption, our skin's able to absorb um, oil and water. We've got sensation, our ability to feel hot, cold, pressure, pain, and also heat or temperature regulation. A rectopeli muscle when we're cold, bringing that hair up to trap a layer of warm air. Meanwhile, all the blood rushes to the center of the body. It's known as vasoconstriction, constricting all of the blood into the center. And our sweat gland when we're hot to produce sweat to evaporate, to cool us down. And all the blood rushing to the surface of the skin, known as vasoconstriction. So how can this affect our treatments? We've talked about how the growth cycle of the skin, the hair and the nail can give us loads of indications of what could be going on with clients and different advice that we can give them. Make your clients understand that the skin can only absorb oil and water. So it's really important that the products that they're using, that they understand that there is that waterproofing layer. And so that's not gonna allow many products through it. So good quality products, usually with the addition of essential oils will help um, be able to get those products down deeper into their skin. Understanding about that desquamation or that natural exfoliation of the stratum corneum and how their exfoliation techniques can help. Understanding to wear gloves when they're using um, harsh detergents, never to use those with bare hands. And thinking about that growth cycle of hair as well um, and how one hair is replacing another. But we might find that sometimes there's a bit of a gap between the two. And then thinking about that whole section or whole system and the functions that come with it.